Hello, everyone. My um, voice is coming back to me now. And um, I wanted to respond to another discussion forum question. And the question is a really good one. Um, and it is, um, what boundaries can we set as teachers uh, or other helping professionals? Because there's other um, people in this course that are from other areas of campus, like child and youth care. Um, what boundaries can we set um, while we're in our workplace um, without getting too involved? Um, is there a certain jurisdiction uh, uh, of involvement we have to follow? Um, or is it purely uh, discretion-based? Um, so that's a, a very good question. And something I have to tell you that I've struggled with a great deal over my career is understanding what the balance is. Um, in psychology, there are more, I think, strict protocols than there are in teaching. Um, so like there are some, for for example, obvious boundaries around um, no romantic relationships with um, clients or with students, of course. Um, in psychology, it actually also goes so far as no romantic involvement with the parent of a child that we've seen or a grandparent of the child that we've seen. Um, so um, the concern there is the power imbalance that would be within a relationship if you had been a helping professional. Um, there's also rules at the university around teachers and, and like professors and students um, and within workplaces between um, uh, like supervisors or, or people in um, power over positions to employees. And all of that is about the same thing. It's that power over dynamic where consent you know, is really difficult to, to like ascertain if like you feel your job is on the line or your grade is on the line or, you know, something like that. So, um, like romantic, um, boundaries are, are very, very firm, um, outside of romantic in, in involvement in terms of like interpersonal involvement, it actually becomes difficult when you're in smaller communities because in smaller communities, um, like if, for example, you get a job up north, everybody knows everybody. And, you know, you might go to church with the same families that you teach, that you your spouse might work with the parent of a child that you teach or work with. Um, so in smaller communities, it becomes very difficult. Um, in larger communities, it's easier um, to keep those boundaries straight. But I have had um, situations where um, um, like parents of children in my my child's class, um, I've like gone into the weight room and they're there and like they didn't check with me first or ask or anything. They're just like, they just booked an appointment to see me. And these are the same parents that came to birthday parties, you know. Um, so I've I've had like some really um, difficult times navigating um, dual relationships and how best to um, navigate them. I would say that as the professional, like so, you know, you know, for me as the psychologist or the business owner, or you as the professional, we we must always model the best possible boundaries, um, which means we must always be thinking about the best needs of the other person over the best needs of ourself. So that is the most important thing, is what is in the best interest of this other person. Um, so for example, um, uh, if I had a patient and they happened to be in the class of my child and my rule in my home is that I invite every single child in the class um, to the birthday parties of my children. I have I happen to have a home where I can do that. Um, some families don't have enough space to do that, but I have the space to do that. But I've been in a position where I've had a patient who happens to be in the class with one of my children and I invite everybody in the class to come to the party. Um, and then it's a bit of a dilemma. Do I invite my patient 
But in that moment, that patient would feel excluded. They would be the only one not invited. Um, so in that moment, it's better for that child to be included with the rest of the class than to be excluded simply because they were my patient, right? So I, I, I think through what is in the best interest of the other person um, that I'm working with. Um, and that, and that can be, that can be challenging. Um, we spend a lot of time at MindKey around the concept of setting smart boundaries. And we spend a lot of time thinking about what our boundaries are with each other. And we think about what our boundaries are with our families. And, um, MindKey actually has created a clinical compass, um, that outlines our philosophy of practice and um, I'll share that with you. Uh, um, one of the core areas is setting smart boundaries. Um, and that's like for all of us, like to teach kids, to teach parents with each other. Um, in um, a mind key amongst ourselves, we have a concept of the four agreements, which was by um, an author by the name of Ruiz. Um, and it is... The, and it's really about boundaries. It is be impeccable with your words. Okay. Um, I know you, like, I've just learned how to make YouTube do this. Like, I can do that. Is, is it going to work? Yeah. <laughs> and then I learned, <laughs> my daughters told me, and then I think this brings balloons. So I've been, I've been uh, having fun with these AI features of I had no idea Zoom did this or what hand controls made it happen. But anyway, going back, um, so we have this clinical compass and we have these four agreements, which is not something I made up, um, which is be impeccable with your words, okay? Um, never take anything personally. Um, always do your best and never make assumptions, and there's a book around that. And I think that's very helpful. That being impeccable with your words is especially important in our field that we don't, you know, talk about a child in the community or we don't like vent about a child in a, in a staff room. You know, I've had children um, where they happen to be going to the washroom and they overheard their teacher venting about them in, in the staff room. And it was traumatic for them. So being impeccable with our words is really important. There was uh, one rule that I taught my daughters that my mom taught me, and that was you only pass along a compliment. You never pass along an insult, right? So if um, my mom said to me, for example, that she really likes my sister's haircut, you know, I would maybe say to my sister in my next conversation, oh, by the way, mom loves your haircut. But uh, if someone said to me, oh, you know, that's a terrible color on that person, you know, I would never then go to that person and say, oh, by the way, so-and-so said this is a terrible color on you. So passing along compliments, um, but not passing along insults, like insult, insults stop with you, right? Like they don't go any further. Um, and for me, that has extended to online behavior, right? Like we only like or share something that is positive. We don't like or share um, something that is designed to embarrass or be hurtful in some way. Um, and I really like the, the idea when we allow children to go onto social media for the first time, or when we give them their first phone, um, that we talk about online etiquette. Um, there's this, I wrote a book called On the Internet, which talks about this. So kind of like a contract that you have with your child. Uh, one of the um, acronyms that I really like is THINK. So um, thinking of each of the letters in that um, word THINK, you know, is what you're posting true? Is it helpful? Um, is it inspiring or important? Is it necessary? Like, do you need to take photos of your food, you know? And is it kind, right? So to be thoughtful about what you post, um, and that would include also then getting permission from people um, before posting something that included their photo or information about them. 
Um, and so teaching and modeling these respectful boundaries, um, I think about boundaries as like your personal bubble, right? We've talked about that a lot. And sometimes we talk to kids about it being like an arm span around us as like our personal bubble. Um, but we also have an emotional bubble and that is things around integrity um, and keeping our promises and um, not, uh, you know, disclosing secrets and, you know, sort of those interpersonal um, etiquette, which is also a kind of boundary. Um, so I think thinking about boundaries, and this is what this question is really getting at, um, and modeling boundaries is is very, very important. And I think it's important to discuss head on with your class um, and to talk about it. Um, because as technology has been shifting and moving, you know, what what are boundaries, like online boundaries, you know, um, there, we have to really think about them. So, you know, there's a, a definition of integrity that I really like, which is, you know, doing the right thing when no one is watching, right? So we do the right thing even when no one is watching. So we, we aren't a troll, even though we're anonymous, it still is a breach of integrity if we're trolling someone anonymously um, because it's not kind, right? So I think having these types of conversations is very important. Now, when it comes to people that you're working with, like with children, <clears throat> it can be a bit harder. Um, uh, and I have to tell you that within the first five years of my career, I really thought I was inv invincible. Like I didn't imagine like that I would ever crash, you know? Um, I, I remember taking all the self-care classes and stuff at university and going through them and just thinking, oh, that's never going to be me. Um, and the, for about my first five years, I would say that was true. I was very strong. I didn't, you know, like I was okay. But, you know, I've been practicing for, well, between teaching and psychology over 30 years now. And and it, and it does catch up with you. Um, uh, there's a, a, a really good quote, which is the body keeps the score. So like, even if you're not necessarily thinking about the stress that you've encountered, you'll feel it in your body, you know, like tension in your body, headaches, stomach aches, grinding your teeth at night, not sleeping well, you know, not that, like that kind of thing. So the body keeps the score. I have to tell you, that's very true. Um, so within classrooms, there's also, we need to be careful about cultural differences because different cultures have different boundaries too. Um, and um, so I'll give you an example. I once was a visiting scholar at uh, the University of Exeter and I went on, which is in England, and I went on these tours to um, uh, special schools there. So they, they in England, they have sort of a, a hybrid um, inclusive model, but they also have special schools, private schools that children with special needs can go to. And um, I went into uh, one of these special schools and a little girl um, ran up to me and gave me a hug and I hugged her back um, because I mean, like if a child hugs me, I will hug them back. Um, I won't go and hug a child, but if the child um, hugs me, I will hug them back. Um, but I was scolded by the headmistress. She she said, oh, no, to, like pretend the little girl's name was Julie. Oh, no, Julie, hugs are only for mummies. You know, so there was a cultural difference there. Um, and I, I think that um, male teachers have to be especially careful around like any kind of physical touch in a, in a opposite kind of a way. Okay. When you're in France, um, it is customary to kiss. Like every time you meet someone, you kiss on both cheeks, you kiss someone you just met. Um, so I, you know, different cultures are different, are interact differently. 
Um, and I practice in both English and French. Um, earlier in my career, I was a Francophone school psychologist, um, and I still do work in French. Um, so it's not uncommon if I'm with a French family at the end of a session, just normally like I would in France, that we would kiss on both cheeks. Like that's just normal in France. Um, but, you know, I, I think certain Asian cultures in particular, that would be very, very frowned on. Um, and I think um, British cultures, there's it's not so touchy-feely either. So there's a cultural component here to consider. Um, now, uh, some, some other things to consider, um, is, uh, if you find yourself thinking about a child, like all the time when you're not at school, that's a problem. So I have found like, if I, if I'm worried about a child and I just can't get that child out of my mind, that's a, that's a worry. Like that's sort of like an indication to me that I'm, I haven't created enough of a boundary or a space between myself at heart and that child. Um, and there was a time for a, like a very long time where I was worried that I was spending more time um, and more invested in the children I was seeing than my own biological children. And that was a great uh, um, dilemma for me. Um, and something that I still talk with them about. Um, but I, I was so invested in doing the very best work that I could. Um, so it is easy to become over-involved and um, to be mindful and careful about that. Uh, I think you want to care and care with all your heart, um, but also be professional and um, there have been times for me where I felt I've given away too much of myself. It's like I've given away too many slivers of my heart and just feel completely depleted at the end of a day. Um, and that's not sustainable. You can't continue on that way. So like I wished I had created a better sort of personal boundary um, at the beginning of my career. I would encourage you, each of you, to think about what your personal boundary plan is, you know, what is your vision of an appropriate set of boundaries? And think about that ahead of time. Give it due consideration. Um, write it down somewhere, okay? And think about that for your own self um, when you go into your own practicums, okay? So part, some parts of that might be not, you know, friending a child on Facebook that you've taught or a parent that you've taught. And um, that has been something that I have done unless there's another connection with that person. So if there's a mother in my class of a child and I've met them first as a mother um, and then they've seen me, I don't unfriend them then, okay? Okay. Um, but I try to avoid social media contact um, with patients. Um, uh, I do like to stay in contact with students, but for students, um, LinkedIn is a better format for that because that's a professional network. So I am connected to many, many former students via LinkedIn, and I, I think that's appropriate. Um there have been times when I was teaching and when I taught, I taught in Ontario. Um, and there were many times where I would, you know, bring mittens or hats or granola bars or, you know, when I noticed that children didn't have anything to eat um, or forgot their mittens. Um, so I would do that um, if I felt, um, you know, and perhaps parents would be annoyed with me. Um, but you know, I, I do do that. Um, I also now, and I, and again, I've had parents be annoyed with me. It's expensive to have a psychoeducational assessment and there's different ways to have a psychoeducational assessment paid for. So for example, Jordan's principal will pay for psychoeducational assessments. If their parent or child has indigenous status, the variety club will pay for psychoeducational assessments. 
Um, so I will often ask a family if the cost of the assessment posed a financial challenge to them, and if it did, how we can navigate that together. And sometimes that's embarrassing for families to be asked that question. Um, but I've decided that I'm going to, you know, um, just explain that I have no idea what their background is. But for me, it would have been expensive. And I want them to know about, you know, what's out there. Um, because, you know, maybe if it could be reimbursed, the cost of the assessment could allow their family a little treat. So I've tried to come up with a way of sharing it that um, is gracious, um, but um, that could be considered a, a boundary vi violation for some. But for me, I've weighed the risks and benefits of that and have decided it's better to share that information than not. Um, so uh, I was, I, I remember once um, when I was teaching, um, I, I was teaching when I was originally teaching, I was teaching a K to eight school. Um, uh, so I was a special ed teacher. I taught primary like kindergarten for a couple of years in French in the afternoon. And then I was a special ed teacher from K to eight um, for two years. And uh, one of the little boys found out where I lived and would come and try to visit me on weekends. <laughs> and so I, I did put a stop to that. You know, I did call the mom and say, you know, I really think the world of your child, but, you know, I don't think it's appropriate that he's coming to my house. So, so there have been times where I've had to put that, that boundary in place. Um, boundaries are tricky. Um, they're challenging to navigate. It's important to think about them. It's important to address them head on. Um, it's important to inquire within your particular school um, if there's any particular policies. Um, Christian schools might have different policies than other schools, so it's important to ask about that. Um, but I really encourage you all to think about your own set of, like your own sort of vision statement, if you will, um, ahead of time about like what you expect of yourself and how you're going to exercise that yourself um, when you go into your first work placement. So I hope that was helpful. I'll include a few little links with this and um, good question. Um, okay, bye for now.